So today we're going to go over uh, a lot of things about compositing. First of all, what is compositing? But before we even get into it, we're going to start with a cute animal picture. Because research, research has shown that cute animal pictures will increase your receptiveness to information. <laughs> this is a California skater uh, chick. It's pretty awesome. So. Uh, the role of digital compositing in post-production. So we're going to talk about the role of digital compositing, not just in, in its sort of obvious applications, but maybe some of the less obvious applications. But before we go into it, we have to understand what is digital compositing, right? So compositing is the art and science of combining multiple images into a seamless single result or image, right? It's, it's one of the cornerstones of modern visual effects. And actually, it's the underlying technology behind a lot of tools you probably take for granted, like Photoshop, um, maybe color grading tools you use, the editing tools you use. They all have components of compositing inside their internal engines. So uh, even if you don't realize you're using compositing, you're using compositing. You're using compositing when you use your desktop computer or your smartphone. I mean, all of this math is what makes the icons composite and makes all of the pretty graphics on the screen. So. Um, it's happening whether or not you are consciously under its control, or it's under your control, I should say. Um, so let's let's look a little bit at sort of what uh, what that math entails, right? And uh, um, let's look at some cool before and after pictures first. So some of the obvious uses of of uh, compositing, right? Uh, taking the green screen and replacing it with all this cool CG stuff, and without compositing, none of this would be possible. In spite of all of the other like crazy work that goes into completing the shot, compositing is what's used to pull everything together at the end. So some of these shots you might not have even realized were composites when you saw them in the film, right? This is, uh, I think that's Wolf of Wall Street. Probably realized that was a composite. <laughs> you might have guessed that that one was a composite too, but you might not have realized how much of it was composited in. It's the same kind of shot. You might not realize that it's actually a composite. So there you go. Uh, something so powerful must be super complicated, right? But in truth, we're going to start at compositing level zero. And it's, there is a level zero. So that's where we're going to start right now. Um, how does compositing work? We have a cookie here. And we want to put it with a cookie monster. So if we want to combine these two images, how can anybody guess at how we would do this like mathematically? If we wanted to add one picture to another, what math mathematical thing might we want to use if we were going to add the two together? Okay, nobody's taking the bait. Let's start with an add. We could literally add each pixel of each image. So the way compositing works is that you're taking, if, if you think of the, the canvas like a giant array of pixels, which is essentially what it is, if you element by element do the same mathematical thing to each one, you can, you can take two arrays and combine them together. So per element in that array, that grid, we're going to do some operation to this pixel, to this pixel, and that pixel, that pixel, and so on, all the way through the whole thing. Let's put it over the background for now. Uh, this background is huge, so I'm going to make it a little bit smaller first. So it's no big deal with such a huge background. The cookie's a little bit more weighted to the size of the background. Um, so we'll take that, and we will we'll add the two together. That's a pretty ungratifying result, right? So we've, we've combined two images, but one isn't over the other like we would expect it to go over the other image. And don't worry about the software I'm using here, by the way. We're going to go into a lot of that stuff, like the software. and also the, we, Right now, let's just focus on the actual fundamental aspect of what will combine these two images together into a pleasing final result. OK. In order to successfully combine an, an image with a background and make the foreground seem as if it's opaque, you need what's called a matte. And a matte is just an image that defines the transparency of each pixel of the foreground image. 
and, and the background image, and we'll see that in a moment. So if we think of this like a cookie, this would be the cookie cutter that cuts the cookie out, right? So let's bring, let's bring the two together here. I'm gonna just copy, I'm gonna copy the, um, the alpha channel, or the mat, I should say, into this uh, cookie so that we have it there. So now when we look at this uh, image of the cookie, it's got a mat in it. Sweet, we can do something with these two, right? Let's add them together again. Nothing, it still doesn't work, right? Well, that's because you need to apply the mat correctly. So let's, um, let's just do this all longhand. I'm actually gonna do this the hard way first. If, if you look at the mat, you'll see that the parts that are the cookie are white and the parts that are the background are black. And the reason for that is because of the mathematical sort of relationship between the two. What happens when you multiply an image uh, or a, a number by one? If you multiply any number by one, what happens to it? Right, if you multiply any number by zero, what happens to it? It becomes zero, right? So this is really convenient. All, the, all of the parts of the uh, image that are black will get completely crushed away and turned to black and everything that is multiplied by something that's white in the mat will, will stay exactly the same value. And then what happens if you multiply it by some number in between, like uh, 0.5? It will be darkened by exactly that amount, by half, right? So you can create in between values as well, all just using one grayscale image. So let's take that and we'll apply it. We'll just use a multiply, not merge. So now we've multiplied that mat with the foreground. So now let's try adding it to the background. Can anyone guess what's gonna happen? Still ungratifying, right? Because we cut out the foreground, but we didn't cut out the hole that we're gonna put it into in the background. So let's take the cookie cutter and we'll use it to make a hole in the background that we can put the, the foreground image into as well. Now to do that, we're gonna have to we have to multiply it by the inverted version of the mat, right? Because we, what we want to do is we want to darken the hole, but we want to leave the outside the same, right? So this is probably not going to work great, but we'll do it anyway. Oh, worked pretty good. Okay. Now we have a hole to put the, the cookie into. Now when we add these two together, we have a cookie that is pleasantly composited over the background. So you see how we applied that? This, op this operation here, all these combined, is, uh, is what's called a mer uh, an over merge. And you might have seen that in some packages like Photoshop. This is what's called an unpremultiplied over a mat operation right here. Of course, you don't have to build it every single time like this. There's shortcuts for it. But this is the deconstruction of the operation that is pretty much the most like uh, the pivotal or cornerstone operation building block that all the other compositing operations are essentially variations of. It's like if we change the order, let's say that we punch the background out instead of the foreground, we would have gotten a, in this case, we would have gotten a sim similar result. But you, know, you, could, you could put one inside the other or whatever. So it all has to do with how you apply the map. So that's compositing level zero. That's how an over operation works. That's how uh, the basics of the math work. I've learned so much from Aaron. Um, can't thank him enough. Um, Wake Self, anybody hip hop fans? Wake Self, you know him? Albuquerque artist, uh, check him out if you, if you haven't heard of him. Uh, even if you don't like hip hop, fun, fun stuff. So I'm doing a music video for him right now. Um, and what he asked us for was, uh, he wanted to shoot all of his stand-up throughout the music video in these traditional iconic hip-hop um, album looks. And as you can see, we have you know Dr. Dre there and mimic the look for him. And so all the uh, sections of his music video are broken up into all these fun little bits that look kind of like the uh, like the albums. So this is the green screen we shot, and this very simple uh, key here. At least looks looks pretty simple. Um, 
So I think everybody's default that they go to is usually key light, right? That's kind of what I was thinking as well. So I did a quick key on him. Just the screen game, the balance. No matter what I did here, it just it didn't seem like I was going to get a decent key. We kind of crunched the heck out of it, but still, when we end up looking at it, yeah, it just wasn't working. Um, so while I was over at Reels Channel until uh, about about a month ago, two months ago, um, I did a lot of these these keys where we'd get kind of. Stuff that was shot okay, but not really ideal. I wasn't there on set. So a lot of times I'd get uh, green screen keys in that were just just okay. And you'd end up putting stuff on the air that looked pretty rotten. And so one of the things that I learned from Aaron was uh, just to start quickly throwing on different keyers to see what gives the quickest result rather than trying to play with one keyer for you know a good half an hour and really uh, noodle it until I got something that worked. And this actually looked pretty promising. I was like, wow, that's close. I could probably make that work. Garbage math him in real quick. But still not quite ideal. Um, anyone use Primat? Okay, see, now I get to show you guys. <laughs> cool. So Prime is uh, one of the cool keyers from Red Giant. And so one of the things I learned when going through Nuke, um, Aaron's Nuke class, uh, was trying out a lot of keyers really quick, seeing what works best, and even if you get this kind of result, which didn't seem that promising from the get-go. This was just picking a color. Um, you guys can't even see how bad it actually looks. Oh yeah, that actually looks pretty good. <laughs> I'm gonna leave it like this. <laughs> um, so they have a, a bunch of fun little tools in here to go in and clean up the noise and crud that's in the background. Now, if you were doing some color correction on this, like getting rid of the green that's supposed to be black, you'd do that first, right? And then mm, I don't. No. Um, usually, what I do if I want to go ahead and get rid of the 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 green screen uh, the uh, the green spill on this, I hate using D spillers that come as D spillers or as like part of key light. I always find they, for me at least, they don't work as well as doing something like uh, simple hue and saturation. And I'll show you what I like to do. Now Aaron might cringe when I do this because I I used to work in television, <laughs> so I do really quick things that work good enough to get by, um, but the, the thing I focus on is speed and just really getting something <laughs> quick, and if it passes my art director's eyes, then it's good enough. So I like just going in, grabbing the green, and saying, well, let's crank up the green saturation and see what we're getting there, and you know, immediately you can see there's a ton of green in them, so I'll rotate the hue just a little bit, Make it a little bit more yellow and yank out a bit of the green. And what happens a lot of times, if you yank out the green all the way, it starts looking really gray and kind of gross. So if you pull out some of the green, you also need to put a little bit of lightness back into it just to, just to give it a little bit more life. This, though, is Jay-Z, anybody? Yes? Yeah, you like Jay-Z. That album cover? <laughs> black and white, right? Yes. So on this one, I got to cheat a little bit. Um, <laughs> and he turns out black and white. So we get rid of the color anyways. Um, it's a good object lesson right there. Yes. About not overworking something unnecessarily. Why, why do you spill it if it doesn't matter in the end? Smart guy. Yeah. He's the one that figured it out. I no, mean. no, no. <laughs> 
lots of lots of good mentoring. Uh, so just to show you kind of what uh, what the end stack of this looks like, so you don't have to watch me noodle through every single bit of it. <laughs> um, so first of all, this was shot um, with a strange codec on it, and I really didn't know what it was, so I had to put a LUT on it because this is how it came in. You probably can't see that so well, but the color is really it's like logish. Logish. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the green screen is actually pretty yellow and rather than going manually trying to get a, a, a curve on this that, that worked, I was able to track down somebody else that used the same camera and uh, they had some LUTs. So if you guys haven't experimented with LUTs yet. Who's LUTs? LUTs? Who, who's LUTs? Oh. And what's he doing in your comp? Do you want to, do you want to tell me what a LUT is? It just stands for lookup table and it has to do with if you have, it's a, it's a curves or a, a a, th a three-dimensional LUT, so you say this color becomes that color. You can either do it along a curve or you can do it in a three-dimensional lookup. So if you have a color here in the cube, it goes there in the cube. If you have a color here on the curve, it goes there on that curve. So I can sh I will be looking at that a little bit and visualizing that, actually. It's but kinda... that made much more sense than what I would have said. <laughs> Another definition is little understood technology. <laughs> Um, but I, I can, I'll reduce it down to the, <laughs> the dumbest thing so we can see it and it will be less confusing. Um, but so this is my silly LUT that somebody else posted and I stole and put on, you know, Wake's footage. Um, that's just the, the base key on and, uh, you know, pretty nice looking key. Looks better over there. Uh, through a key cleaner, um, S mat ops. Yeah, this just softens it a little bit. I really like uh, their tools, uh, Sapphire. Sapphire makes cool tools. So um, in terms of the paradigm here, it looks like it's all very linear. Like you have, like you're stacking up filters, you're stacking up layers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, you guys all use After Effects, but in case you don't know, the top, uh, the top filter effect goes on first, then the next. I'm on its way down. Um, uh, just to get it to match, I noticed that uh, in the album, it wasn't really black and white. It's kind of got a cool blue tint to it, some some different things going on. So I threw a neat little tritone on with a few different colors. Not a huge difference, not a lot of saturation in that, but it's a little blue for the mid-tone. A um, little reddish on the shadows. And what was this? Oh, that's white. So that is your basic key in uh, in After yeah. Effects. Woohoo! Yeah. So I think you guys have seen a few green screen keys of this guy, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Has anyone tried keying this shot? Do it! <laughs> Do it! <laughs> yeah, I downloaded the, uh, the high res off Vimeo thinking that this was actually a pretty decent uh, file and it's not it's horrible so if we just uh, throw a basic key on it you guys can't quite see how Damn. nasty that is why can't they see that that's <laughs> it looks bad it looks really bad um, so yeah the, the key is pretty awful so uh, a, a neat tool that I found for uh, dealing with really bad footage is using smooth screen um, also from red giant and so what you do is you can just go in and pick the color of the screen and it'll try and level out uh, most of the, the colors. Anybody use Red Giant stuff here yet? One, yes, good man, good man. Oh. Um, you, you should check it out, use the demo. I'm sure they have a demo. Don't use the crack. Um, so all of a sudden this, this key came out a lot better. I know you can't see the before and after difference, but it's better now. All the blocks went away. So that's, uh, so that's the track based paradigm or the layer based track based after effects based paradigm. And if you compare that to, I'm going to show you the node based paradigm here, which I already explored it a little bit, but we'll look at it more. Um, and real quick plug, wakeself.com. Wake self. Wake self. Well, he was really cool about it. So, if you guys want to check it out, cool dude. Yeah, looks cool. Oh, switching over. It's all you. So that was the that was the layer based paradigm, and uh, 
I was just uh, workshopping this before I did it for you for real, so let's do it for real here. Um, and so most of you seem fami already familiar with After Effects. Who here has uh, like felt like they've ever hit the wall in After Effects and just got super frustrated with, yeah. Okay, so now I'm gonna caveat that by like saying uh, what I'm showing you now is not the magic bullet. The magic bullet is learning how compositing works, which we're gonna explore a little bit more once I show you the node paradigm. But node paradigm, it's, it, it matches sort of the high end um, expectation a little bit better. If you look at any of the good, the, the kind of canonical literature on compositing, like the art and science of digital, digital compositing or digital compositing for film and video, all of the flow graphs that are presented in the text are in a node paradigm, right? So if you wanted to translate them into something like an After Effects, you have to kind of go through a translation step in your head in order to like translate the concepts presented in their flow charts into the software. Whereas when you're using a node paradigm, it's almost like a one-to-one -one mapping of the way that it's shown in, the, in the, the compositing books and the way that it's presented in the UI. So that's my plug for nodes. Question. But, yeah. What is a node? Uh, this is a node. Hey, good question. It's almost like it was a softball setup. Um, so, uh, in a node-based paradigm, rather than having the layer-based paradigm like the Photoshop or the After Effects paradigm, um, which, you know, it's, it, it works, it's a good paradigm, but it, it hides some of the information from you. Remember we talked about how mats work, right? In Photoshop, do you, or in After Effects, do you ever feel like you actually have, like, direct ownership of the mat slash image relationship? Not without special plugins. Yeah. And so th that's, that's a big difference between sort of the mindsets between more of the node-based tools and the high-end tools and say like in After Effects and Photoshop's is that they, they coddle you a little bit and I would say that's, that's kind of good at first because it gives you, I'm, I'm a big advocate of like getting results and feeling like you're making headway but when you start to hit the wall in those paradigms because you feel like for whatever reason something's just out of your reach like you can't actually control certain things that they have these um, these like sort of mysterious WTF moments of where you can't get a handle on stuff, um, then it's time to start getting, uh, digging in, learning how stuff works under the hood, and then taking ownership of some of those details that After Effects and Photoshop hide from you. And I think it's very apparent as soon as you start dealing with uh, unpremultiplied and premultiplied uh, color correction, mm -hmm. which I didn't really understand when I first uh, started using Nuke and you know, I was very frustrated with not being able to get the results I wanted, especially with edge stuff and weird stuff going on in After Effects as well as in Nuke. And uh, yeah, when you showed me that quick little <laughs> checkbox of yeah. unpremultiplying it first, yeah. that you know that I think that uh, helped me understand it a lot better. So let's talk about that a little bit, actually. So we we looked at how the mat works with the foreground and the background to cut out the cookie and then make the cookie ho the hole for the cookie to drop it into over the background. That logic, by the way, for compositing images is as old as film compositing. It predates digital. The exact same logic was used to create a traveling mat, hold out the foreground, hold out the background, and do the, the final optical composite. The math is literally one-to-one -one match of how it worked optically. So, though, I guess you could say it was a little bit more subtractive when they punched out the mat rather than multiplication. Multiplicative, but you know, it's still it's the same logic. Um, so uh, there's certain components of compositing that I guess what I'm trying to say is that are evergreen, like they don't change regardless of the technology. It worked on film, it works in digital, and whatever you learn in terms of those fundamentals will continue to work in digital and can be applied to any application that you work in, like. I don't want to make it sound like this is a complete like nuke love fest, even though they're one of our sponsors. <laughs> because we're going to also look at Fusion, which is another node-based paradigm. Um, I'm, I'm just more of a fan of nodes than I am of tracks because um, especially when composites start to reach moderate complexity, the, uh, the, the difficulty of managing the composite starts to outweigh uh, like what you would get in nodes. Now, up to that point, the track-based paradigm is actually faster. Like you can get more done on a simple comp quickly in the track-based paradigm, for sure. There's like no question. Yeah, and most of my, I still, I own Nuke, I own After Effects. I usually use After Effects for most of the work that I do because I do a lot of motion graphics work and quick keys. So 
um, it, it really doesn't make sense for me to switch over to Nuke every time I want to pull a key. Yeah, unless it's a complex, like it's a unless real it's difficult something one. something that's complex or you need it to look really nice. Yeah. So, okay, so let's, uh, what was I going to show you? Oh, uh, uh, pin multiplication and all that stuff. So, um, uh, Josh mentioned multiplication, pre-multiplication and unpremultiplication, which is like the most awkward name ever. What does that mean? Um, it has to do with the status of the mat versus the foreground image. We started with the cookie that was not cut out from the background. The, uh, it doesn't have a mat either at this point. So let's inject one. And now it's got a mat injected into it. When the mat is in line with the image like this, it's a four channel image rather than a three channel image. And it's typically called an alpha channel at this point. I mean, that's kind of the way I've seen it normally called. Um, you see, it's got a mat, but the mat's not doing anything yet. It hasn't been applied to the foreground. This is an unpremultiplied state. It means the mat has not been multiplied with the foreground. And remember when we did our longhand over operation, one of the first steps we did was cut out the foreground by multiplying it by the mat. That, that still exists as a delivery format. You think, why isn't everything just delivered this way, unpremultiplied? Why is there two states for a mat? Well, because uh, there's various contexts in which a mat could be given birth, right? It could have been extracted from a green screen, like Josh was showing, in which case you would have a foreground that never had a mat in the first place, and you'd have to figure out how you were going to apply it. So that's a natural sort of fit to an unpremultiplied starting place, right? Or it could have been produced uh, synthetically, like computer graphics, in which case it was rendered by a machine, and the machine knows exactly what's transparent and what's not, right? So it's going to deliver that image to you in something more like a pre-multiplied state, which would look like this if it came straight out of the renderer and it would already have the mat applied and the image and the alpha channel would be embedded in line. So there's two ways you could, uh, and you can find a, a, basically encounter a mat in one of these two states. Now, why is it important to know? Because once you've multiplied the foreground by its mat, which is how graphics come out of renderers almost exclusively, unless you tell it not to do it that way, there's a mathematical relationship between the foreground and the mat. You cannot change one uh, without breaking the relationship. And when you want to do something like a color correction, usually that implies that you're only going to be color correcting the color part, not the mat. And even if you could color correct the, correct the mat, the math might not always apply. It depends on what you're doing. It may not apply to the foreground the same as it applies to the background. In which case, what you'll get, well, you'll usually see the symptom of that along the edge in those semi-transparent areas. Obviously, the perfectly opaque and perfectly transparent areas aren't going to be affected much. But this little, little crust of transparent, semi-transparent pixels is where it will manifest itself. The edge will appear to become lighter or darker or whatever. So that's why it's important to understand that state. After Effects completely hides that from you. It basically in, invisibly uh, does the right thing for you when you color correct something that has a mat in it already. But you'll notice that it does ask you when you bring a new piece of footage in if it's pre-multiplied or not. <laughs> so you still have an opportunity there to mess it up when you first load the footage into After Effects. So you're never off the hook to understand this detail no matter which, what software you're working in. Uh, you just There's a little bit more burden placed on you in most node-based systems because they do not Again, like I said, coddle you. And, and they assume that if you, if you modify the foreground without modifying, or modify the color without modifying the mat, that that's what you intend to do. That's what you would, ex your expectation as an expert user is that the software does what you tell it to, not something invisible behind the scenes, right? So if, a lot of people will say stuff like, oh, After Effects, or Nuke is harder to learn, or it's more technical, or whatever. Yeah, you need to know a little bit more, but not that much more. Have you guys ever had uh, the horrible experience of getting weird gray edges or something funky <laughs> happen with the edges when you start trying to color correct it, that's because that's it's why. pre-multiplied already. Yep. You got rid of those edge colors and you don't have them to work with anymore. Let's try to make it, let's try to make this artifact intentionally. So take the cookie and um, over at the background. And we'll put a quick transform in here too. You know, now that it's, you're trying to break it, it's not gonna break. I, I know, this is all, I always, I always do this demo, it's like, I'm gonna make the edges go all weird and I can't do it. But um, 
because it, it's only for demos. It's subtle, so I'm going to do it after it's been pre-multiplied, which means it's now been it's been, it's got a mathematical relationship with the mat, and I'm trying to think of one that's almost guaranteed to uh, create a problem. It's gamma. See, it's it can be such a subtle effect; it's hard to uh, hard to make it manifest. The edges are getting too bright here, but uh, here I'll, I'll do this one with sure fire. This will work. Offset. So, so what I've done is I've lifted all the blacks. This is another slightly different scenario, but I've lifted all the blacks, which of course broke all my mat, uh, the the validity of my mat. I pushed all of the areas I cut off back up into gray. Um, so the proper workflow for this would be to make sure you do your your color corrections before you do your multiply, your pre-multiply of your mat, or another way you can do it is to, and this is uh, interesting, you can unpre-multiply something, right? If you multiply something by something, you could also just divide it by the same thing, right? And the problem there is that, of course, you've created potentially areas that are zero, and you're dividing also by another area that's zero. So you're dividing zero by zero, which technically should make the universe implode. but Fortunately, the computer or Nuke is smart enough to know that you don't mean it, and it just ignores it when you do that. So, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Let's try it. Ah, so the world didn't implode. I was hoping for something more spectacular. So we unpremultiplied it. This is kind of lame because since we had to premultiply it, we'll just hide that. Pretend it was premultiplied all the time, um, and then. Do the grade, and the mat, we've not touched the mat. Um, uh, most node-based packages will allow you to operate on just the channels that you choose to operate on, and that usually means all the channels, but sometimes it just means I just intend to work on the red, green, and blue channels. So this, this particular operation is, uh, we'll talk about what nodes are in a moment here. In case you haven't figured out, that's a node. Um, so. Uh, then we can pre-multiply it again, and that will reestablish the relationship between the mat and the foreground. You notice the edge got all nice and transparent again, and then the merge works as expected without any craziness. Okay, so what are nodes? Uh, let's get rid of all this junk for now. Uh, these are nodes. And in a node-based paradigm, rather than having layers, of things and stacks of things and timelines of things. What you have are streams, I guess you could think of them, of data coming in through these read nodes. So these nodes are reading data and they have a sort of an implicit notion of time. They can read the clip and then they'll play them back frame by frame as you move the time slider. And then uh, operators, which are colloquially known as nodes. So these operators will then up do these things, if you haven't figured it out by demos by this point, they do the operations that they're, that they're named. So um, I copied this alpha channel into the, or the red channel into the alpha. I pre-multiplied it. We did a color correction. It's a common color correction in Nuke is called grade. It's like probably the number one go-to awesome thing. We'll use it in a couple of other demos I'm gonna show just how powerful it is. So we can do a grade operation, which will allow us to color correct it. Remember, we wanna do that before the pre-mult. Okay, I have a quick question for mm -hmm. you then. Now, you were mentioning that in After Effects, you have one thing over another, over another, over another, it's layer-based, mm -hmm. and I, and the reason I asked this is because I didn't quite get this when I first started in Nuke. It looks to me like what you're doing is the exact same thing. You got your footage, and then you got your copy, which is a stack on that, and then grade on that, and then a pre-mold. How is that different than what After Effects is doing? Um, How is it handling it different? It's actually internally, it's doing the same thing. It's just that you have an interface paradigm that's a little bit, I think, more human friendly in a lot of ways. So, for example, uh, it's, it'd be hard to build a comp in a demo complex enough to start to demonstrate all of the things, but I can open up a comp for you that's already been done um, that would show you the, the, the level of complexity that's possible. So, to get the same effect in After Effects, I'd have to do a comp, put an effect on it. Pre-comp that pre -comp again, put maybe, another effect yeah. on it. Pre -comp. Okay, and that yeah. would take me weeks. Especially when it comes to, like, maybe we'll see some of that here in a second. Um, like, uh, I'll, well, I'll show you an, an example, right? And you can do some of this stuff in After Effects, too, 
with expression linking. But um, so I have my my basic uh, nodes. It doesn't do anything unless I tell it I want to do an operation, just like adding a filter in After Effects. Um, and uh, let's do a different merge operation, shall we? We'll do uh, this cookie monster is unpremultiplied. It's in an unpremultiplied state also, so I can't just do a basic merge. But you'll notice that the merge node has a lot of different merge modes in it, similar to After Effects, right? After Effects has different blend modes. You can use this merge node to bring two images together via a particular recipe of a merge. We already looked at how the over works. A lot of these other merge operations are variations of how the over works. And one of the cool things about uh, that this is that you can see the shorthand for how the math works, right? So if you go down the list to over, which is one we already know, you can see that a that over is a plus b multiplied by the inverted alpha channel. That's what that shorthand means. The big A is the foreground, the small, the big B is the background, and the small A is the alpha channel of the foreground, and the small B is the alpha channel of the background. So um, using this shorthand, you can actually, in very a succinct way, represent the merge operation uh, symbolically, just using a little bit of uh, algebra. So. Um, so you'll notice we, it skipped a step that we did in our longhand version and never cut out the foreground because a typical over expects the foreground to be pre-multiplied already. Let's say that you, you got something from computer graphics rendered from a 3D package. It would come to you pre-multiplied. And part of the reason for that is legacy. It's because historically a multiply was an expensive operation. I'm talking about back in the like Pleistocene era when um, computers had like less than a meg of RAM. <laughs> like they had like kilobytes of RAM, um, um, a multiply was a very expensive operation. So they would pre-do that multiply and sort of just cash it out into the file itself. So that was a, an optimization step for them to, to save the images in a pre-multiplied state. It also helps a little bit with things like um, for computer, because a lot of you got to realize a lot of these things track the evolution of computer graphics itself. So um, for a rendered image, by blanking out all those areas that were transparent, making it black, you could get better compression. You could do like run length encoding and various things like that. So that's why we still have some of these different uh, things like pre-multiplication. They come from the very early days of computer graphics. They're still con they're still convenient today, so we keep them. Um, so rather than doing a merge over, which is obviously not working, we'll use a, a mat, and which allow us to do a unpremultiplied merge straight away. And let's uh, let's start building this comp up to show sort of the the coolness of like the stuff you can do with nodes versus say like a track based paradigm. So I need I have I have all the things together, but it's certainly not a pleasing composition. That cookie looks absurd. Um, so let's get the cookie monster in a slightly better place and let's get the cookie in a better place. Um, maybe the cookie shrink it down a little bit. And that's cool, but what if I wanted to move the two together? In, um, in After Effects, you just expression link them or something using the pick whip. But how? Yeah, I'd parent them. Yeah, parent. You can use parents now, that's right. So how can I parent in a node-based paradigm? Because I've got these things that were all so far apart. Well, it's a slightly different paradigm, but I can do uh, what's called a clone of the transform. And now I've effectively parented these two transforms together, and I can transform these two all together scale it around that if I want to. No, I like the cookie monster big. Let's keep him big. Reposition him. Um, After Effects has a notion of uh, concatenation, or what did they call it? Um, collapsing transforms. Um, I can't remember what they call it oh, exactly. Oh, yeah. But most node-based systems have a notion of concatenating transforms as well. As long as transforms are adjacent to each other, they will be combined into a single step. So there's only one, actually only one transformation. They message to each other. So they kind of are a special case. Color, uh, in the past, uh, in, in Shake, they would uh, concatenate the color transforms as well. But now that we're working in full floating point all the time, and we'll talk about some of what that means later in uh, Nuke, but uh, you don't really have to worry about that because everything's done at a very high level of precision. So um, as long as you put your color operations very close together, they effectively concatenate as well. So what does this add up to? It means that uh, the quality will stay higher uh, even though you're doing complex operations. They're combining into a single step. So there. So that's uh, that's a slightly more complex workflow. Uh, let's add a filter to the background um, 
a defocus and uh, it's relatively fast. And we'll edge blend because this mat is kind of screwed up on him. There, now it all looks pretty good. So um, that's uh, that's that's a very quick run through when you already have mats made and, and uh, how this stuff works. Now I have. Um, who wants to learn more about just like the, again, the evergreen aspects of compositing that have like, this has not a lot to do with Nuke. We're gonna talk about just like the basic types of image manipulation available to you. I'm gonna use Nuke to demonstrate it because I'm fastest in it, but you could demonstrate this in Photoshop, you could demonstrate this in After Effects or anything. But do, would you guys like to learn like just the basic types of image manipulation available to you in any package? Okay. I've already seen some of them in play, but I'm going to enumerate them and, and we'll go through them one by one. Uh, first of all, let's talk about color, uh, color manipulations. Because um, this is something that's a little confusing for some people. Uh, so I have Marcy here. Marcy's the... Uh, oh, that's not cropping. There we go, yeah. This is the old digital test image from the Cineon scanner. So this, this thing is as old as digital film itself. So, um, And then on the right, what I'm doing is I'm plotting a gradient that's just a linear gradient. So without doing any color manipulations, we get this line that just goes from 0 to, to 1. Basically, it's plotted from 0 to 100, but 0 to 1. So we'll be able to see the results of a color manipulation to the curve of the image. And then it'll become a jumping off point for some other notions like gamma and stuff that we can talk about. But um, these are called global uh, operations, which means that they affect every pixel. When I apply this adjustment, it's, effect, it's, it's applying this math, it's the best way to think of it, to every single pixel uniformly with no, uh, you know, no weighting to one way or another. Um, so we'll just start with a simple one, which is add. We're going to add a value to every single pixel. So that does exactly what you'd think. It just lifts everything up uniformly. And black becomes white-ish, grayish. And uh, white becomes whiter. So we'll look at, uh, we'll look at multiply. We can multiply the image by a simple value. And you can see. As you would expect, it doesn't touch one, and it pivots or, or zero, and it pivots around zero. So, as I multiply it by a lower value, it multiplies every single value until it, it gets darker and darker, until it turns black, until I hit zero, and it flattens out the whole image to zero. <coughs> so um, that's what, what a multiply would do. Now, this is this is one that is very confusing to a lot of people. So this is why we'll dwell here a little bit, which is the gamma operation. And what gamma does is it applies a, what's called a power function. So it's a non, this is a nonlinear uh, function that affects the gray values but doesn't touch 0 and it doesn't touch 1. So let's watch how it plots out when I change it. See, as I go darker, it's darkening the midtones, but it's not touching 0 and it's not touching 1. So that's the gamma function. And we'll come back to how this can be extremely relevant to what you need to do in computer graphics in a moment. But um, one unintended consequence here that can occur in floating point, and unfortunately this graphing tool doesn't show us the superluminous values, but is what happens to the values that are over one in a floating point thing. Now you notice that Marcy's hair is like really uh, quite bright here. And if you look at the color picker here, Let's put this into the spot meter. Come on now. Try to put this in. Who here knows stops and all that stuff? Exposure, EV. Put the, I just put the color picker into EV so you can see that her hair is going quite bright. And if you look at the, 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 the digital values here, you can see that they go over one. So her hair is going up to like EV four or five. And the digital values are going well above one. Now, um, who's familiar with floating point compositing versus 8-bit like compositing? Okay, a little, a little bit. 
So um, I'll put this meter into 8-bit mode. And for those of you familiar with Photoshop, it tends to show things to you by default in this sort of 8-bit scale. Watch what happens to this. Um, I have numbers on the left that are going above 1, but my 8-bit values are all hitting 255, which everybody knows is like white, right? Well, that's not, that can't be true because the numbers on the left, if the scale goes from 0 to 1 and 255 is, is basically 1 or white, what's happening to all my values that go above 255? 255, right? So float, what, what the difference between floating point and 8-bit is that floating point uh, representations will allow you to have massive numbers. Like in this case, we're working on like 32-bit float, which goes up to like a lot, like billions. From like in, 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 in integer, in, compared to integer, it goes to from zero to like, I can't remember the number, but it's very high. <laughs> and um, and then also can, can represent every floating point value in between those as well with increasing precision as you get down between 0 and 1 because it's optimized to really have precision in that range and, and also contain very high values. Whereas when you work in an 8-bit uh, integer working space like Photoshop classically could, it can work in floating point now also, you're capped at 255. Any value that goes above that is history. Never come back. So... Floating point's a very powerful uh, feature, not just, for the, not just for the improved precision between 0 and 1, but also for the extended dynamic range, the HDR component. Um, Marcy was shot on film. So does this mean film actually has higher dynamic range than digital did then, traditional? That's why they had to come up with special ways of handling it. But um, now that we've linearized it, put it into a linear scale, you can see her hair is going up almost to 3, whereas... Uh, had we been stuck in an 8-bit paradigm, it would have only gone to 1. Yes? Um, so how much can a monitor change the presentation? Okay, right now, there are not too many monitors that can actually directly display uh, anything uh, that's extended dynamic range. That's going to improve as we get into the newer digital uh, standards like REC 2020. We'll have, I'm not sure how they're going to map it, but it does have a, has a higher contrast range, so it has a little bit of extended dynamic range. Um, your perceived, uh, uh, your perception of the dynamic range has a lot to do with contrast ratios that the, the monitor can deliver. So it has to do with the difference between the blackest black and the whitest white. So you could map it to whatever you want, and in the correct viewing surround, you should be able to see it. You guys missed the uh, the NMPA thing where we did color. They had a, a, a high end colorist. I can't remember his name. Her name. What, what was the colorist that came in for that color event? We had this um, pretty. Um, pretty famous colorist come in and demonstrate this stuff. And then we had Charles Point come in and talk about the contrast and color stuff. But a lot of this factor of how much dynamic range a monitor or display can deliver has to do with this viewing surround and the, the kind of contrast ratio that it can give. So when it comes to mapping it to the screen, it gets a little bit, it gets a little bit uh, nebulous. But, um, <laughs> but in, in essence, none of them at present uh, deliver anything above one. So the reason her hair looks clipped, it looks clipped on my monitor too, is because every value that's going above one is not actually being displayed as anything besides one on the screen. Now fortunately, Nuke and After Effects also have a, um, a brightness control for the viewer alone to allow you to look down into the thing. And you can see there's still detail in her hair. All I'm doing is darken, it's like turning down the brightness on the TV. I haven't changed the signal, but you can see that there's, that there's detail in her, in her hair there. So, so, so without that, and with and without that little uh, knob in After Effects, the default you can really see zero to one. Yeah, that's that, all that can make it to you. Or almost. That's all that'll make it through the screen, right? Yeah. So it's still in the buffers, but it's not going to get out. It's not going to come out the screen at your eyes. So you gotta, you'll have to use a control like this and color pickers and stuff when you're not looking at it, inspecting it in the shadows like that, in order to intuitively know what's going on. Now this is, a, this is an area for, part of the reason that floating point compositing evolved for feature work was because of this issue of having to deal with the dynamic range in film and also the new digital cameras. And also the, what uh, renderers can produce, because pr renderers can easily produce any value. So they, they essentially natively work at floating in, in, in high dynamic range floating point. They have for years long before it was practical to composite that way. So 
um, floating, compositing in Nuke and compositing in other packages, compositing in, in floating point and other packages, all evolved as a response to the need to deal with these high values, actually. Um, so, uh, so now we have tools to deal with it. But you also, it puts the burden on you to, to deal with them and not break these, these higher range values. Like, it's very easy if you, if you want, if you don't handle them correctly in your workflows to clip them off or to distort them in ways that make them highly nonlinear, which is what I'm about to show you. So um, we're changing the gamma. And so watch what happens to the curve. So it's going down darker, right? Great, my image is getting darker. I'm making it darker, right? Turning the gamma down. Um, but let's inspect uh, what's happening to Marcy's hair here. Um, I'm gonna color pick from this brightest area. Ooh, wow, look at that. Those values just, exploded, they, they went like truly nuclear. Because, um, and you should be able to see this intuitively even without knowing how the math works. Uh, you see the tangent of that line is going up. It's not sticking flat. So all these values that go above one are just shooting off into to nuclear land. So that is one caveat when dealing with gamma and floating point that you should definitely look out for. And it, that would be true in any package. Uh, After Effects, any other package would do that. So keep an eye for that. So that's gamma, changes the midtones, but doesn't touch black or white, but actually can touch everything above white, so you gotta be careful with it. Um, color lookups, remember I said we were gonna do color lookups. So let's look at the interface for the color lookup. Color lookup's pretty straightforward. Looks like this one already has something on it. Master, ooh, look at that. Fancy S-curve. So. Let's clear this out so we can start from scratch. Start with an empty curve. Whoa. Looks like uh, I want to reset it so we have a nice fresh one to work with. So the way that a color lookup look up works, and this is just a basically a 2D LUT, is it's looking at one axis represents the input image and the other axis represents the output image. So if we say, let's, uh, I can't remember which is which in this representation, so let's grab the middle here and see what happens. It's getting brighter. Okay, so this is the input image here along this axis, or along this axis, and this is the output image along this axis. So if I go, this is the 0.5 pixel brightness, and I go and I look up to the curve, looking up, and I say, where am I hitting in the output image? You'll see right now I'm just hitting at 0.5, so it's just gonna return 0.5. But if I change the shape of the curve, now it's saying I'm returning 0.8. So 0.5 now becomes 0.8. So that is a lookup table. Lookup, it's, it's represented as a curve in this case. We're building it via a curve, but that's a lookup table. Um, it could be completely arbitrary though. This could be total noise. You could say this value is gonna become some completely arbitrary value and make it just look like garbage, but that would be pointless. Um, so lookup tables demystified. Uh, and then we're gonna look at a grade, which is the uber everything color uh, of all these basic reversible color modes in Nuke, color grade. So it's got controls that any of you that have done color may uh, recognize, lift, gamma, gain, uh, all that kind of stuff. And it doesn't look like much because it just has these sliders, uh, but you realize that you can actually pick, you can actually multiply and offset all these different things along color channels as well. So let's try that. Let's do something kind of lame, like we'll multiply the whole image by some color. It's less lame than it sounds. Ooh, she's getting all blue. Or let's take away some of the others. So we can tint the image just by multiplying it by, and you can see the way that the colors split apart as I did this, each channel is now 
plotting separately because I've multiplied them by different amounts, each red, green, and blue channel. Looks like you had a question. Mm -mm, I'm just looking. Looks like <laughs> she's, uh, what's her name from uh, Willy Wonka. Oh, yeah, uh, the one that turned blue. I don't remember her name. Neither do I. <laughs> Violet. That would make sense, right? Right. <laughs> looking Violet. So this has all these different controls in it, and we'll explore these in a, in a different uh, section when I show you sort of like why it's useful. Like why is floating, because we're going to talk about floating point and linear, and then we're going to talk about why does that matter? Because uh, it's a distinction, and uh, uh, that type of workflow, uh, floating, uh, floating point and linear workflows, uh, are, have pretty much taken over in terms of high-end workflows, and people are using them even in After Effects and other like low-end things, and they're actually starting to become somewhat semi-common even for basic workflows like color correction with things like ACES and, uh, and in DaVinci. DaVinci operates internally all at floating point, but uh, there's an overlay you can do, which is this linear workflow, which we're going to look at here in a second. I don't know if it's a good time to take a break. It might be a good time to take a break. And then, yeah. yeah. Um, so I love motion graphics. I didn't really consider myself a motion graphics artist, I think, until a couple of years ago. Uh, even though I've been really doing that ever since I started this about 15 years ago. Because um, motion graphics really does encompass a lot of, of different things where if you're doing title animations, if you're doing um, cute little animated GIFs like these guys. Um, this, this is not mine. Um, the reason I have these guys up here is because uh, one thing I wanted to share with you guys is uh, some cool tools if you guys do like motion graphics, doing that kind of stuff. Um, uh, these are some very inexpensive tools that I bought. Um, one of them, Battle Axe, uh, I still haven't even used, um, but immediately after I saw the, the tool in use and what people were doing with it, and some product demos, I, I saw that this is just one of the coolest uh, new tools that After Effects really needs to have as a kind of base tool in it if you're doing any type of uh, character animation. Um, so, yeah, if you guys, links, character animators, woohoo, uh, general motion graphics, um, they're not paying me for this, and honestly, it's like 30 bucks, I think, so really, really cheap. This, uh, this one guy, um, wrote Mount Mograph, I forget his name, uh, he makes just tons and tons of great, um, tutorials on his YouTube page. Some of them are, you know, a little... A little basic, but um, the stuff he does is just, it, it's really fun and uh, gives away a lot, of his, a lot of his time. Okay. So I just wanted to briefly touch base with, or talk about something. Um, compression. When you guys are shooting your own stuff or having somebody shoot something for you. Um, always try and get 444 if you're getting, a, you know, something that's shot as an MOV or whatever. Um, and not 420, not 400, 422. Um, and I just want to show you the reason. Um, whenever, you know, they decided to do this fun compression on, on video, um, they, they quickly realized that if you, if you compress the chrominance and luminance, uh, you're not going to get a big hit in terms of visual appearance. Um, let's see, we got... Uh, Who's that a composite of? That's Billy Bob Paxton. It's Billy Bob Thornton oh, that's and Bill it. Paxton. And yeah. I just swapped their, their faces a little bit. But that's a good, that's a good, yeah, that's a good illustration for how, like, if you decimate the chroma, it, it kind of looks the same. But yeah. It's different. <laughs> In the end. <laughs> uh, so in the first instance, I'm just going to blur the heck out of the illuminance. And we really quickly start losing. I mean, this doesn't look good. This looks pretty bad. So that is the, uh, out of the 444, four, four, that's number one. That's the first four. Um, that's the first four, which is the luminance component. So they split the luminance and the chrominance apart and then decimate the heck out of the chroma part. And if we do that... So now, yeah, mutilate your chroma. Eh, you still see what's going on. Wait. It's fine. 
right? So you're only getting the chroma, so yep. you're still getting... Well, the um, H and uh, the hue and saturation. Oh, you're in HS. Uh, yeah. Switch it to um, YCBCR. That'll illustrate it better. Yeah. Same same idea, but a slightly different. We're doing a slightly different presentation. YCBCR. There we go. So we want to change the last two. So what am I blurring out there? Green and the blue. Green and blue. You want to change the green and blue. Yeah. Oh, for this one. Yeah, that's the Y chrominance and the blue chrominance. So this is kind of the equivalent of changing, uh, modifying. So he's blurring it like a huge amount right now. You see, and you can barely see a difference with your eye. That's how sensitive your eye is to the luminance component um, compared to the chroma component, which is why they choose the chroma component to uh, to, to decimate that. Um, so it's a form of very crude, <laughs> very blunt compression. They, they just say, we're gonna, instead of having a red, green, and blue channel where we keep all the information for every single red, green, and blue channel, we'll split it back into three channels again, but we'll make one of them luminance and the other two chrominance. Well, and the then we'll take away like half or uh, three quarters, <laughs> depending on, it depends on the format, huge percentage of the chroma part and then save that. And so before they even compress it through a codec, they, they like pre-compress it by compressing the color or decimating the color. Yeah, but you see, you can barely even see and you're blurring it like some huge amount. Yeah, so in short, 420, 422 is gonna look fine to you guys, but since you, if you're pulling a green screen, you're actually pulling it off of the chrominance. Mm -hmm. You don't wanna compress that or else you're gonna get stair-stepping. So even though it looks nice, it's not gonna work as a green screen key. Because it That's can, it can. The computer can see the difference. Your I may not be able to see it, but the computers, computers algorithms can see the different, can see the decimated color. Does that make sense? So yeah. Anyway, okay. Cool. Oh, and, and be on set when you guys are having somebody shoot green screen stuff for you. Make sure it's evenly lit. Because they're gonna just assume that it's gonna be great. It's never gonna be great. Just be on set, and it's you know that one hour, two hours, three hours that you're down there is going to save you another 20 hours in post. And how do you light a green screen? Could you just talk a little bit about how on a key um, you still get indication of flickering on the... Uh... Okay, uh, yeah, that, like, you, the, some of the spill that comes onto the comes on to the user. So I got then this setup. up. This, um, this shot doesn't have a lot of spills. So Are you talking about it. in key light where you get that blotchy? That blotch, and it, yeah, and it those holes? Yeah. The, the, that's from the suppression. Being, that's what Josh was mentioning yeah, earlier about being too strong. <laughs> I hate key lights. Um, key, uh, they're they're a green suppressor, um, and you have the option of going. Oh, what is it called? I'll just pull up the name here real quick. You don't have to switch over to me. Um, okay, so the replace. Uh, the replace method. It's replace color. Um, you have a few different options for replacing color. You can either do soft color, hard color, or source, or none. Um, it defaults to soft color, I believe. Um, always switch it over to source, and what you're gonna get is just your default green is still gonna be there, and you're gonna have to do your uh, green, uh, your uh, suppression afterwards. Does that make sense? And I, I can show you that workflow here because again, this is it works in any package. You could it would work oh, in after key light on it. It would work in after I, I don't know if it ships with key light. Um, so using the suppressor within key light. Yeah. I think it, it comes with Primat for sure, but the, there might be a better way of using it that I've never found, but in all the years that I've used it, um, I just I turn it off. Yeah, well, because you know that the, the, the the, the best workflow is to not use the suppression in the keyer. <laughs> and I can show you that workflow pretty quick if everyone wants to hang around a little bit over time. Um, this is applicable in any compositing system. It's a little easier to implement in a node system because it's easier to split and uh, branch and merge things together. 
whereas in a, a, you'd have to pre-compose it in After Effects in order to do this workflow. So you'd make one layer that was the layer just for doing this, this green suppression, which Josh showed you a strategy just doing hue suppression. Um, and I've seen that exact same strategy applied in Nuke using what's called the hue correct or whatever. There's a node that, that's basically got a hue keyer in it that you can adjust hues in it. So they do that same, very same approach. They adjust all the green out. It's a completely separate pass. And then they make their key and then they combine their mat and their suppressed version. So um, that is actually the go-to sort of, uh, I think that's the playbook of every high-end compositor I've ever seen. Nobody ever, they rarely use this fill suppressor in the keyer because you don't have control of it. Uh, so why would you want to use something you can't control? Um, and then there's another uh, go-to thing, which I probably won't have time to show, but using the, the soft mat, hard mat technique, which is the other go-to technique, you create one hard mat for the core and then one soft mat to capture the transparent edges, but I probably won't have time to, to really go into all that. Um, so Does this- that answer all your questions, sir? Yes. Okay. So, so the suppressor is basically just reproducing the opposite color, which is, in this case would be magenta. Not, all, not always opposite color. Um, it to, can, to off, offset the green key. It can use a various numbers, various different algorithms to, to achieve the result. Uh, the, the kind of common one, the canonical one mentioned in the literature is the suppress by a channel or the limit by a channel uh, approach, which uses a, uses a, almost like an expression. If it's greater than this, let it through. If it's less than this, like clamp it down. So then that makes, uh, makes obviously, if we look at this here, here's the red channel, red channel, green channel, blue channel, right? You can see red and blue don't have a lot of screen, they don't have a lot of luminance. That's why you want to use a very pure color for the screen. Uh, if we were to say, well, you see your skin tones in red have plenty of red. If we say never let the green screen get brighter than red, here's the uh, green. You see she doesn't have any more green in her skin than she has red, which means her skin tones will never change. And her, in this particular case, her blouse or her jacket is neutral color, so it will pretty much look the same even if we say, I'm not saying swap one channel, I'm saying pixel-wise, pixel by pixel, if the pixel in the green channel is brighter than the pixel in the red channel, make it the color of the, green, of the red channel. Or you could wait. You'll see a slider sometimes that says red, blue, wait, or whatever. It, it'll be the weight of the two channels that you aren't trying to suppress. Let's say, this is the one I'm clamping, the one I'm trying to suppress by. So that's, that's the canonical screen suppression thing. And, and then another approach is a hue-based approach where you find the hue and sort of tweak it by hue. But, um, see, I haven't done that, but I'd love to actually see how. It's in the video. I can send you the video <laughs> of which video I have it in. Um, and then there's even more sophisticated ways because if you do that, if you do that approach to screen suppression, you can see there there can be a problem there. The red channel is actually quite dark in the screen. What if the background's really bright? Sort of more like that. What if she's against the sky, right? Like how? Are, how bright should the green screen be? Okay, yeah, so the, now, now we're talking about a different thing. In terms of lighting, how bright, so how do you light a green screen? Well, first of all, you want it very level, very evenly lit. Within, if you can achieve it, a quarter stop across the whole thing. I mean, uh, that's pretty hard, but you should aim for that. But how do you expose it, meaning what, what's your stop? What do you expose it to? And it's very simple. You expose it to key. If you have a gray card and you put it in front of the screen and you light for that card, that's what you light the screen to. And, um, you do that regardless of whether or not the foreground is bright or dark, which that becomes problematic because when you light a screen that bright, it becomes a giant bounce card and you're gonna get a bunch of green bouncing off of it. So the only solution is to put the subject as far away from the screen as possible because in that way, any green <coughs> that's spilling off is sort of spilling at an angle that is um, like par more parallel to them, doesn't wrap around them as much like a big softbox would. And so it's sort of confined to just the edges. Um, sometimes obviously that's not tenable because you have a giant green screen psych and you have to put them right in the middle of this giant green screen psych. Um, but that all, now all of a sudden the whole issue of lighting the key becomes no problem because you had to do that anyway to light the subject. So, um, you know, it's all, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's always surprising to me, it's the video people in particular who seem to struggle with the notion of how do you expose a green screen. It's, you expose it to key. <laughs> it's like, how much simpler could it be? If you expose it anymore, you're gonna blow it out and it's gonna be overexposed. If you expose it less, there's no screen and you can't pull a key, so. Um, so that's the answer to that. If you look at that on a, um, on a waveform. Yeah, that would hit. Um, well, you don't look at the green on the waveform. You'd look at the card on the waveform. So yeah, it would hit if you did 18. See the green on the waveform, you would see it around 50, 60, but it'd be a straight line. Probably would be around 60. Yeah, yeah, be around 60. And being, the skin being up around 70. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 
he could afford to go brighter if it's not cl clipping, you know, but that would be more of a creative exposure or, a, or like a technical exposure where you intend to degrade it down later anyway. Um, yeah, earlier we were talking about exposure theory and protecting blacks, basically. Like digital cameras are kind of noisy in the darks, but they also have <coughs> limitations in the highlights, so you have to protect the highlights too. So, you know, um, I tend to light around the highlight and then work around that. But when you have a screen, now you have one other thing you got to put a pin in, which is the screen. <laughs> so I, then you, I tend to light around that exposure, that stop. So. Um. And if you're, uh, if you're shooting at 442 color space, which is basically 10 bit, right? Mm -hmm. 422, like 10 bit. 422, well, it depends on, on, the, on the Kodak, yeah. You might have a chance, but if you're doing 420, like any of the agencies. No, it's going to be nasty, gonna yeah. It. But 444 or some kind of log or raw format, you're going to have a lot more. 444 is ideal. You if you have 12 or 16 yeah. bit. If you, can, if you can swing it, you want to do 444. Now, one cool thing is a lot of the new modern cameras have a raw, a raw mode. And it's uh, pretty pretty nice because um, I, I always like to oversample as much as possible. And so consider this: a lot of the new HD cameras can shoot at 4K, right? And they may be able to only do like 422 at 4K. So for any of you who know what the hell I'm talking about, but that uh, the, the twos mean that you've decimated the chrome by half. You've blown away half the chroma. Um, if you oversample it to 4K, but then you run it out to the codec in that. But then when you do your comp, before you do your comp, you just, you're, you're acquiring at 4K for a 2K, uh, for a 2K uh, delivery. When you scale it down, you've essentially recaptured that because you turned all those two pixels back into one. And uh, so you've oversampled your luminance by four times and you have uh, 444 again, or you have like 8244 or whatever you want to call it. But now all of a sudden you've fixed a lot of the problems with your chroma subsampling. One of the other issues you get with video, though, codecs in particular, is their implementations tend to be really like inconsistent. So you'll get like chroma creep and all kinds of other weird video-specific artifacts that are completely independent of the compression part of the codec. And um, you know, you just got to live with that. Uh, you'll find like you'll see these in, in this when I pull the key from this. This has a lot of this examples of this because this was shot on like one of those um, old Panasonic cameras that was like three one some weird three one one highly Oof. yeah just mutilated <laughs> but you can still get a key off of it um but uh but yeah if you have like something like a red and you can shoot at 5k or whatever doesn't mean you're going to produce your stuff at 6k shoot at 6k run it out to some 444 container uh when you develop what do they call that when you freeze raws to files whatever they call that now when you make your initial sort of working files from the raw files transcode, transcode from raw to a container, um, take that opportunity to just scale it to a reasonable resolution, but you will have oversampled, by oversampling everything, you would have, you will have defeated some of the issues with uh, shooting up from a single chip camera, which um, it can never deliver a resolution equal to its photosite count, so you beat that problem by oversampling there. And then uh, by delivering it from the raw rather than some video-ish codec, you kind of dodge the bullet of doing chroma subsampling in a, a, a crappy video codec, right? Like, you will not have to cope with that issue at all. Now what you have to deal with is massive file sizes instead. But, you know, disk space is cheap. And, don't, and do this only on your key stuff? In other words, yeah, you your effects plates. Don't, don't do it for your whole movie if you don't have to. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, that would just, it might make a workflow that's untenable, depending on your resources, right? Like trying to shoot a whole movie in raw. But, um, okay, so let's... Uh, so basically what I wanted to demonstrate here is this, this workflow that I mentioned. Um, so this is Fusion. It's very similar to Nuke. I didn't have a chance to get into the Nuke UI, but um, its uh, paradigm is a little different. It has these two fixed viewers. Uh, you might be able to split off and make more, but as far as I know, this is, this is how I've used it so far. Each viewer has an A and a B, so it's a little different from Nuke in that respect. Nuke has multiple views connected to each viewer. You can have as many viewers as you want. It can get completely out of control. But this has two views with an A and a B each. It's got a view LUT. It's not quite as slick as the one Nuke, but you can always um, turn on the view LUT and uh, edit the view LUT here so that you can do things like adjust the, the gain and stuff of the view just like we were able to do in Nuke. So it's got a, a similar functionality in terms of the viewer. It's node-based. Uh, you can split and separate uh, and recombine things and uh, Things are named a little differently, but in the end, uh, it, it can work uh, very similarly to Nuke. 
Uh, the nice thing is that it's free for any use uh, up to, like I said, Ultra HD, whereas in Nuke, the free version is only technically usable for non-commercial work. And you can get a student version, which is, of course, only usable for student work. For around 250 bucks, you can get it bundled with uh, a couple other things. I think you get, you get your choice of a couple other programs. There's a couple bundles. So the highest you can output for free in the free version, 1920 by 1080? It's only Ultra HD. 3,800 and something. Yeah. <laughs> Quad HD. Yeah, so only 4K. <laughs> oh. It's quite a, quite a deal. And if you pay for the $1,000 version, you can get unlimited render nodes. So for the cost of basically Nuke render licenses, you could buy hardware, uh, if you think of it that way, to use with your unlimited render nodes with. So you know, it's, it's compelling simply because of cost. There's some things about it that do bug me a little bit. The UI still feels a little raw compared to Nuke's. Like, it just hasn't been workshopped as much in production environments. So I think there, that's going to change over time as more people start to use it. Blackmagic Designs is, now that they've acquired this company, they were awful at marketing before. And I'd even met them in person. They couldn't even, like, deliver their marketing mes message very well in person. And now, uh, now that they're owned by a company that's, like, renowned for their marketing ability, I think uh, they'll probably do a little bit better. But, um, but yeah, it's definitely worth looking at just because, you know, you can use it for anything you want without any, um, oh, I connected that to the pony, not to hey, the... pony. So here we have Ultra, this is Ultra Keyer. This is their built-in Keyer, and I didn't have time. This is something you get if you did one of my lessons, like how the heck do Keyers work? It's kind of the same as, just as the over operation works, a Keyer works internally in some known way, and it's not complicated, right? Like, and so it's, it's kind of worth knowing how they work internally simply because when they go wrong, you know why. Just like when the over goes wrong, or when your pre-multiplication thing goes wrong, you know why, rather than being this magical black box mystery that makes you just like flail and, and do, I've seen some really amazing solutions to technical problems, but they're totally wrong, but actually somewhat worked. So it's better, to, it's better to know why it's going wrong and fix it for the proper reason, rather than doing some, you know, sacrificing chickens and doing a weird dance and doing it that way. So the uh, first thing with Ultra, this, this is the built-in keyer, and uh, it's, it's actually not that bad. For, uh, uh, but once you know how keyers work, you realize, well, I could you know, hand roll something like that too. So yeah, maybe it, it's not so tough for them to create their own keyer. You don't need key light. You don't need Primat, though they do have Primat. Uh, if you know how a keyer works, or when you, can, when you have an expert who knows how to make a proper keyer, which they've done here, um, it does have its own suppression uh, thing. So one of the things I do with, uh, um, with the, this is I wouldn't uh, worry so much about the, the transparency or actually pulling a key. I'm going to make one just for doing this screen suppression as we talked about. So this track is only going to be for our screen suppression, and we're going to make another track to pull our key. And, this, and I, we probably won't see this all the way through the end, but I just want to show you this workflow while, while we look at this in a little bit. So where's their spill suppression? We've got, uh, we've got various choices from... This is what I said about their UI being a little weird. I mean, okay, it's cute, but you know, well done. You can control how much you want to do, and they have a very cute nomenclature for it, right? So there we go. We'll just go with medium. It's burnt. That's um, weird. Burnt is just taking a very, you know. And so uh, I don't know, you know, like oh, they're all very cute. They've got they've got a lot of tools, and this is, uh, you know, when you come from a different background, from like a shake or a nuke background, some of this stuff like. I always considered Fusion's tools sort of uber, like they pack too many things into one node. So it's like, it's great if you know the idiosyncratic behavior of the various nodes that have lots of functionality packed into them. But if you don't, it feels like you're used to working in a more verbose way where you can see everything in front of you in nodes rather than a one uber node that has some hidden functionality like this fringe gamma slider. You know, like that, this is adjusting essentially the gamma of the mat that is being applied to the background. Like this wouldn't exist in like Shake or Nuke. But you know it's here. So if once you start to learn that idiosyncratic behavior of this package, you can start leveraging that and actually go quite quickly in this package. That's what the, the advocates for this package like about it. Once they adjust to the paradigm, they really start to kick ass with these like Uber nodes that do like way too much in each node. Um, okay, so we got one to do our green screen suppression. So let's make another one to uh, Ultra Keyer to do our actual mat. So I'm going to take. Is another thing that's a slight pet peeve is that the way that the, the, the noodles work is a little bit more touchy in this than it is in, say, Nuke or Katana, which are packages I've, I compare it to. So let's. Um, sometimes you'd rename these. I'm not going to bother because I know what I'm doing here. I'll get lost soon enough. Um, 
So you can just pick the color of the screen that you want and um, add it to the screen. And this is ultra keyer. So, so it's kind of like permanent. Yeah, what we're adjusting actually this is the pre um, the the pre uh, stuff. Where is it? Um, these uh, pre mat ranges. It's kind of picking some stuff to help separate it. Sure. So there uh, there we have it. We actually have a mat in Ultra Key, <laughs> Ultra Gear, and that was all there was to it. And then um, what we would do is uh, if we wanted to combine them, it would be it's similar to Nuke. They have a different nomenclature for it but uh, it's called channel booleans. And this is, um, I don't remember which one it is, which is the problem. It's this one. I got the right one. Woo. So then we can copy the alpha channel of, I might have gotten them backwards, but um, I want to copy the alpha of one into the alpha of the, oh, no, that's the wrong one. I got the wrong one. Back channel boolean. Copy the that alpha into that image. You can see I'm less adept because I've been using this one a little less long than I've been using Nuke, but um, I think I got it. The way. UI, I think, just looks a little clunkier. Yeah, and that's that's my main gripe about it is that um, I want alpha. This is the foreground. So, like for example, in Nuke, these noodles would be actually labeled. There'd be little flags hanging off of them that I could tell what was the foreground, what was the background. Here, I have to like hover over it to see what it is. Once you get used to the color coding, you'd be like, oh, you'd always remember the gold one is the foreground and the green one is the background. But um, channel boolean background. So I want to copy the these around. And then copy alpha of the background. Yay. Um, so now the math is pretty much the same. I use a merge operation um, to do the foreground over the background. Or the other way. When they demo it, they never do it as as crudely as I do because it's just like Nuke. If you connect the if you select the nodes before you drop them down, they automatically connect, so you don't end up having to drag stuff around like this. So there we go. So that's like, oh, I've got all this junk I got to get rid of. There's a mat input on on this that you can actually attach. Um, they don't call it spline; they call it a B spline, or a, they don't call it roto. They call it no a B roto spline. node. Yeah. See, everything's got a different name. And then it'll hold it'll hold out the operation based on um, based on this spline. So if I want, I can just draw a spline just around her to G matter out. This is a lot like Photoshop. I'm doing a really crappy job here, but hopefully I got it the right direction. So it's just a garbage map to get rid of it. Yeah, it's a G mat. So, which I don't have. Is this a G mat mask effect? my GMAT is not good. It's actually getting its format from this rather than um, the other one. So what I would do is I would apply this GMAT first up here. So I'd probably clean up my uh, alpha here with my GMAT that I created. So I'd apply it to this to clean that stuff out. So I could do like a... Um, Do you guys have any other questions at all? Yeah, like about I'm just, life. <laughs> yeah, I'm just showing you how this thing works. We had a, an assignment recently, and there was some questions about when you uh, have a, you need to format an edge map. 
Mm -hmm. uh, which one would go on top of the other in a layered experiment or in, in, a, in this? So I'll, I'm actually kind of showing you how I would do it where I would um, pre-process the mats to combine them. So don't forget that mats are images just like every other image, which means you can composite mats the way you could composite other images. So rather than using, uh, let's say, um, over and things like that, you could do things like you could mold the mats together, you could add them together. If you do it safely, if you don't add them above one, you could max them to like say, I want the maximum. So for like, that's a great way of bringing core mats in. You say, what's the max of this mat and this mat? And now all of a sudden all these little holes you had in your mat go away because you had this nice hard core mat that you dropped in and maxed it over. So what does max mean? I compare each pixel and go, what's the brightest of the two values and give me that. Um, and then Which in I'm, After I'm Effects, do something like that right here. I would just dump the uh, the core mat in on top. I can't remember. See, there's a hotkey for actually reversing these, and I can't remember it. But see if like an no shift X, huh? It's it's just like that, but the different. <laughs> like my muzzle memory is not here on uh, on uh, ah getting so close. But anyway, you guys get the point. I'm not as adept when it comes to fusion, but it's the same stuff, but only just remixed just enough to make it like hard to, to, for somebody to adapt quickly. So all my muscle memory is built up around Nuke, but um, it does, has all the same functionality. So you can do, like as you can see, this is similar to how I would process a mat um, to combine a core mat and an outside mat. I, I do a composite operation to bring the two together, have a nice clean mat coming in before I copied it in, and then I would, then I would apply it. I'm gonna keep going, you can keep talking. Uh, great way to I Never let software defeat me. <laughs> Great way to think about doing keys, though. If you're going to do anything that's going to look good, you're probably not going to be able to pull it with one key. Um, yeah, not for not in real life, that's yeah. for sure. Uh, if you have core mats to fill in any holes, any bright bright spots, anything that's catching your green, um, and you know, usually you pull a different key for a hair versus uh, something that has a hard edge like a suit, um, and you're really just going to get the best results like that. Um, if you have a client or an employer that is a cheapskate and doesn't want to pay for anything and thinks that a 7D is a good camera to shoot green screen on, oh yeah, um, I've they'll, done pay, they'll, they'll end up paying for it somehow, but it's not going to be at the camera. It'll be uh, know, in the time that you spend pulling that key. Yeah, um, since the of the four two zero whatever it shoots it at. Since the one thing that isn't compressed is the four, Voila. that's the luminance. Um, if you shoot a white screen, if they actually get the white balance right, uh, great alternative for, I mean, it's not gonna look good, but it's gonna look better than if you try and uh, pull a, a green screen key with it. So let's make, a, let's make a core mat out of this one. We'll adjust the gain to make this really hard. And I'd show you how I do it in Nuke, even though I'll probably flail again trying to get this just right. But um, so we'd make a, a nice crispy, nice crunchy uh, core mat. Uh, mat fusion. So we crank the gain out of this. Give it to me. And if push comes to shove, let, let's say I want this thing to be just right, and I can't get the keyer to give it to me. Don't again. Don't forget that a mat is just. It's just an image like every other image. So if I want to use image processing things on my mat, the way I would apply them to, uh, uh, to uh, any other image. So in this case, my goal is to make this hard, and I want it to be tighter as a result, too. I don't really care if it's, uh, you know, if it's loose like that. It can be super crunchy and tight. Um, so let's say that I could keep monkeying with those all day, or I could just take this, and I could color correct the mat directly. Just say, I'm going to go take the mat, and it's an image, and I'm going to manipulate it. And you'll see this, you'd see this a lot from somebody who comes from like a nuclear shake background. So we'll take this and we'll do a color, um, we'll do a color uh, gain, let's say, on it, and uh, adjust the um, gamma stuff of just the alpha. Got to make sure we view it there to make that nice and crunchy. And we could even use, um, we'll, we'll do a negative lift. We'll push this into black, which is dangerous because now I've made negative uh, values potentially here in my mat. But um, but I'm intentionally doing that too. Oh, I'm doing the 
Oh, rip camera, there we go. I'm doing that to tighten it. But I've, I've actually created negative values in my mat too. No, it looks like it's clamping, that's good. So now you could take this mat and to bring it in, I didn't get as solid as maybe you'd want to, but um, there we go, gain. So I gained it up and then I offset it down, which is totally lame, uh, but it's not clamping, which is good. And then, or it is clamping, it's not going super luminous. So now I could take this and I could max it in with my soft mat that I made here in this like soft mat one, right? So all you do is you just take, for this operation, you would uh, combine that using um, like a channel Boolean like this, but instead of saying copy, you'd say like maximum, like that. So you could probably just drop down another channel. channel. Oops, ah, I lost my frame. Where my rotor was all on that frame, that one frame. Channel bool So they call these th different things, like new, Duke doesn't call this tool a channel boolean. It calls this tool like a shuffle um, or shuffle copy. So, I mean, they all have different, they have slightly different names, just like even though it's a node paradigm, it's using nodes to, in, to, to, to create the logic flow, but the tools are named slightly differently. Um, I'm not sure there's probably a decent guide out there that has. There's like a Rosetta Stone for yeah. this. <laughs> so you understand what's, what's supposed to be what? So, oh, did I do channel boolean or? One did I have here that oh, that was channels boolean channel boolean. It's interesting. It's a completely different UI. It takes a while to adjust between different packages. Let's just copy it and paste it. That's another cool thing about nodes, by the way. Copy and paste them. So instead of copy, I'll do a max. And because the only thing that I really care about in this track is the mat, I'm not even going to bother to constrain it. I'll just max them all. Um, so, foreground. Just the alpha foreground. Yeah. Let's see if it gave me what we want. It's probably going to, yeah, there we go. So you see the way that the, it filled in all of the holes in the in the mat, is that showing up there? It's kind of hard. Well, no, you can see. When I maxed that in, it just made the, the brightest thing, the brightest of the two. So now I could take my exact, because I clean it up. Um, I cleaned it up later here somehow. Where did I clean it up? I broke all that. But then I cleaned it up, then I copied it in. So it, it's like if you pre-process the mat uh, before you use it, then you don't have to worry about trying to like the order of operations of how you're going to apply it in a layer based paradigm. If I was going to do it in something like an After Effects, I would pull the core mat and I would just probably over it inside to just fill out the density of that thing. But to be honest, that's not, that's not the cleanest workflow because think of um, context where that would completely fail you. Like I need to break out the layers I created to hand them off to an artist who's going to make stereo out of them, let's say. Like, how am I going to get that mat ever? How am I going to recover that mat in an After Effects thing? In, in a node-based paradigm, you just say, well, I got the good mat right here, and you just tap it out and pull it out, and you're ready to rock. So that's part of the reason why the nodes are preferred for the high-end work workflows, because uh, of just how much easier they are to intercept and use. Sorry, I'm going to break in here for a minute. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and do our drawing. And then... So thank you all very much for coming, and thank you. Yeah.